Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hey everybody, this is the Digital Asset Investor and I am as, about as sore as you can get. I decided that I was going to start swimming and I went and, and swam for the first time um, yesterday and my goal was just to survive, to not touch the floor, not touch the, the bottom of the pool for 30 minutes and I did survive but barely. <laughs> it was by any means necessary. Um, every stroke you could think of to just do nothing but not touch the bottom. And I, I achieved the goal, but I am sore today. There, I've always been told that there's no better exercise than swimming, and I, I believe it after that. And so that's my, that is my new mission. Anyway, let me tell you what. I've been doing this channel for a long time, and there's, there are not many times when there's just so much out there that I just am completely overwhelmed by it, so I'm going to do the best I can do today and cover some of the more interesting things. Um, but before I do, I want to talk about Link2 and Uphold. Link2 and Uphold are both my sponsors. The links are in the top of the description for both of them. Uphold is an exchange, and in my opinion, it's one of those exchanges that's always kind of missed. Everybody talks about Coinbase and Binance and all this. Well, I use Uphold more than any of them. And Uphold seems to be last man standing, uh, not last man, but <laughs> one of the ones that always seems to be doing well, okay? Um, Link2, who sells private equity, has Uphold private equity on their platform right now. I own Uphold private equity. I think I told you everything. Anyway, if you want to go check it out, the links are in the top of the description. If you're interested in opening an Uphold account or uh, buying Uphold private equity, it's, uh, you got to be accredited investor on Link2 to, to do that. Link will be in the top of the description. Click on it. Tell them DAI sent you. Okay. Now, before we get into all the major controversy going on with this um, FTX stuff, I don't want. I didn't want this to be missed. Patrick L. Riley, um, he his company is CEO of Reaper Financial. He has filed an amicus brief as well. So I think that makes is it thirteen. Um, James Flan tweeted out and Patrick Riley says the SEC versus Ripple Labs case is a national security threat. I agree. I serve the people of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. So good for Patrick Riley. We won't get, get any further into that. There's too much to show. Check this out. I don't know if this is true, but I'm, uh, I've seen it from a few places. Former FTX employees say that Sam Bankman Freed is missing and most likely on the run, and they're saying it's coming from the Wall Street Journal. Then there was this one. Just in, Justice Department launches investigation into FTX. Then SBF gone missing, and now this. Sorry to anyone with money in FTX. I mean, it's horrible what's going on here, folks. Now, let's, let's show you. I want to give some credit to CNBC because I go after them as hard as anybody for carrying a narrative instead of instead of actually being journalists. And so I want to give credit to Andrew Ross Sorkin. I want to give credit to Squawk Box. This, this is all we've ever asked of, of CNBC, is to hold these people accountable and make them squirm if the questions are, are leading to the truth. If it's going to make them squirm, tough tomatoes. Ask them anyway. Um, it's your job. And so I, before Gary Gensler was being interviewed this morning on Squawk Box, and this shows you social media works, folks, we found out yesterday that Gary Gensler had been having meetings with FTX behind the scenes while he was suing Library and Ripple with no fraud allegations. He's meeting, having coffee, tea, and crumpets with the guy who is committing fraud allegedly. Okay? We don't know that for a fact, but allegedly... That's what it, people are saying. It looks Ill, Ill, possibly illegal. So I told CNBC, if you get a wild hair and decide to conduct an actual interview instead of helping Gary carry a narrative, ask him about his meetings with Sam Bankman-Fried. Well, to Andrew Ross Sorkin's 
Um, credit, here we go. Gary, you said uh, people should come in. Watch Gary squirm. Gary's not used to having to answer actual questions, folks. He goes. He only goes on shows where he doesn't have to answer any anything tough. Because if he ever did, this guy, he would probably make the people that put him there look so bad that they would finally fire him, which is what they should have done a long time ago. You will. Uh, Sam Bankman Freed, it appears from your calendar, uh, on March 29th, 2022, at 4 p.m., came in and actually met with you, uh, along with Brad Katsuyama of IEX, someone who has uh, draped himself in the flag, if you will, of, of, of an honorable exchange. Do you feel like you were hoodwinked? I think we've been clear uh, uh, in these meetings, and you uh, can look uh, at my, if my calendar's public, uh, many meetings with folks in this industry. It, very clear in these meetings, same message to the public, same message to them, uh, that non-compliance is not gonna work, the public's gonna be hurt, but also we're gonna continue on these dual paths, and if we need to, going to be the cop on the beat, going into court, uh, putting the facts and the law in front of uh, judges. Think about that for a minute, folks. So Gary is meeting with a guy who's running his exchange out of the Bahamas and selling to U.S. customers. Meanwhile, Gary's suing Ripple, who's, who's tried to work with the SEC from day one. No allegations of fraud. They're suing Library, who's, who's tried to work with the SEC from the beginning. That's who you got here, folks. What you've got here... The problem is not crypto. The problem is corruption in our government everywhere. That's the problem. And I'm going sh to sh prove it to you here in a second. Don't you worry. Speaking of government and potential corruption, well, anyway. I'm not saying Elizabeth Warren's involved in corruption, but I am saying she gives me the eebie-jeebies. She's buddies with Gary, remember. She says, the collapse of one of the largest plat uh, crypto platforms shows how much, and remember, it's her buddies, it's, it's, it's her party that's been, that, that this guy was like their second largest donor. And I'm not making a political statement here. I think both of these parties are bad guys. <laughs> I'm just telling you, I'm just pointing out the facts here. Platforms show how much of the industry appears to be smoke and mirrors. We need more aggressive you know, this sure does have a feel of a setup, doesn't it? Um, we need more aggressive enforcement. I'm going to be keep pushing the SEC to enforce the law and protect consumers from financial stability. Brian Armstrong from Coinbase says, FTX was an offshore exchange not regulated by the SEC. The problem is that the SEC failed to create regulatory clarity here in the U.S., so many investors and 95% of trading activity went offshore. Punishing U.S. companies for this makes no sense. Then Brad Garlinghouse says, Senator Warren Bryan is right to protect consumers. We need regulator, regulatory guidance for companies that ensure trust and transparency. There's a, there's a reason why most crypto trading is offshore. Companies have zero guidance on how to comply here in the U.S. Compare that with Singapore, which has a licensing framework, token taxonomy laid out, and much more. They can appropriately regulate crypto because they have done the work to define what good looks like. And no, all tokens aren't securities, despite what Chair Gensler insists. All right. And so we have that. All right. Now, I wanted to make sure we point out, because Gary Gensler was meeting with FTX. Okay. I, I showed two meetings and then here we've got uh brian armstrong showing that ftx is an offshore company i said gary seems to be drawn to working with people who operate offshore to avoid u.s regulations the usa has become one shady country run by shady folks so sad and what i'm referring to is george sora gary's during his lawsuit against ripple and library and leaving ftx alone he's been meeting with george soros and this is George Soros. To avoid scrutiny by the security. Right. Which is that the Soros hedge funds operate offshore in the Netherlands Antilles to avoid scrutiny by the Securities and Exchange Commission. So even while Soros tell. These are the people that Gary talks to and, and has no problem with while he goes after people that are trying to obey the laws in the U.S. and operating out of the U.S. That is where we are as a country. 
And then we've got this little issue. How a crypto billionaire decided to become one of Biden's biggest donors. This is America in 2022. And again, I would show that if it was the other side too. Remember, Jay Clayton came from the Trump. So I'm not, this is not a political thing for me. Both sides have plenty to answer for in this whole thing. So did, I think Hinman, well, Hinman came from the other side too. He was born of the other side. This is not a party problem. This is a USA corruption problem. And if you still don't believe me, well, just watch this. Remember, Gary Gensler was the head of the CFTC um, before he was bef before he ran the SEC. And normally, after you watch this, normally you'd think to yourself, well, wait a minute. Why would you take a guy like that who's a, a multiple-time failure slash there's all kinds of shady stuff around him. Why would you then put him at the SEC? Well, you wouldn't in, in the world you and I live in. Just watch this. Becky Quick on Squawk Box is comparing FTX to MF Global. Even if, even if you're not talking a Ponzi scheme, even if you're not talking Bernie Madoff, just the commingling of funds gets you back to like an MF Global situation or something. I mean, there, there, there are big issues, and that's a big no-no. Good morning, Carl. Well, the hearing is already going on, and what you're seeing is something fascinating. It is a hearing that's really all about MF Global, but the chairman of the CFTC, Gary Gensler, has recused himself from talking about MF Global at all because of his personal relationship to John Corzine dating back to their time at well, Goldman Sachs together. Well, then he shouldn't be there. If he has to recuse himself on anything, he has no business being there. So you're going to see senators grilling with questions about MF Global. Gensler not able to respond. He's brought some deputies up. This issue has raised the hackles of Republican senators just before the hearing. Senator Richard Shelby of Alabama issued a letter to the Inspector General asking for an investigation into how the CFTC has handled the MF Global issue. He said thousands of customers have been denied access to their funds. And as a consequence, many are facing tremendous hardships. And in addition, Senator Pat Roberts of Kansas was grilling Senator uh, was grilling Chairman Gensler. That is at the hearing already this morning. Take a listen to what Pat Roberts had to say. We must find out what happened with MF Global. And fortunately, the manner in which Mr. Gensler chose to step aside or recuse himself has raised more questions than it has answered. Why did he not recuse himself from MF Global issues from the beginning of his term if there was a conflict based on his previous relationship? Why did he wait until, until November 3 to decide he should step aside instead of doing it immediately on October 31 when everything came unraveled and MF Global declared bankruptcy? When, when they specifically say that Corzine was named CEO of the company in part because of his relationship with Gensler and his ability to navigate through and influence the rules that would have Affect MF Global, and of and course it became it became a prime dealer during the period uh, during the period of Corzine and indeed Gensler. With the one of the effect. key questions in all this, Simon, is to what extent was Corzine personally lobbying in Washington to make sure that MF Global had the ability to make the enormous bets that it made on European debt that turned out to be so bad? To what extent was Corzine personally responsible for pushing the leverage up at MF Global and clearing the regulatory thickets in Washington to make sure that that could go ahead and happen? But from a regulatory standpoint, and that's not Corzine's issue. He's just another player in the private sector. That's Gensler's issue, isn't it? The conflict of interest. Interest. He's the guy that should be actually standing on Capitol Hill and explaining exactly what went on. And fundamentally, they failed because they didn't protect those segregated funds. The regulator has failed quite clearly. Well, that's the question that we're going to get in today's hearing. And that's why it's so fascinating that right now, Gary Gensler is sitting before a Senate committee testifying on this issue. They're going to want to ask him all the questions. But because of this recusal, he's not going to be able to necessarily answer all those questions. He's brought up, as I said, a deputy to handle all the MF Global questions. So he's going to have to respond sort of. You're going to see Gensler do the same thing at the SEC, folks. Just sit back and watch. Now, I want to make sure you point out, go watch CNBC today. And compare it to that. This is back when some of our networks and some of our our quote journalists actually held powerful people accountable. Now they won't even bring up this kind of stuff, folks. That's how scary it's gotten in this country. It is sick. It's twisted, and it's it really it, it saddens me for for the future of my children. It makes me sick. All right. And then from crypto law, here the the in the interview with Gensler this morning, they also he also 
took a, a chance to brag a little bit about his library ruling. Well, let's talk about that, Gary. The library ruling, which, by the way, he hasn't been mentioning over the last few days because he's been behind the scenes trying to figure out what to do about his self-created FTX mess. Would say, look, you have uh, been talking about the need for regulating uh, and yet have not. There's been lots of focus. We had you on. These people, very surprisingly, CNBC, probably because of how bad, this is probably a real good indica indicator of how bad this FTX thing is, is the fact that CNBC is kind of going hard on Gary Gensler. Last time uh, when you went after Kim Kardashian, uh, but on a relative basis, going after Kim Kardashian uh, compared to uh, what is now a, a massive undoing of FTX um, isn't enough. What do you say about that? Look, I, I think that investors need better protection in this space. But I would say this, this is a field that's significantly non-compliant, but it is, it's got regulation and those regulations are often very clear. And we have multiple paths. And one path is working with those uh, crypto exchanges, crypto lending platforms, and to get them properly registered. And why that matters is that so the public's protected. But we have another path, which is enforcement. We've brought between my predecessor and, and the teams uh, now at the SEC, um, uh, at least 100 actions in this case. And we've been very clear in these various uh, uh, enforcement actions. And we had a big win even this week on a crypto token called Library, where a court clearly said, you've been on fair notice. And yes, this is the securities under the securities law. But, uh, but, but Gary, in, these, in, these, fairness, these, these this, in fairness, in fairness there, there are millions, if not billions of dollars that are gonna get tied up that potentially will get lost in this situation by in investors, uh, not just retail investors, but pensions <coughs> that have given money to venture. See, that's the CNBC's buddies at these pensions and all their, all their buddies on Wall Street are really pissed off today. And so finally, they're going to go a little hard on Gary. That's my impression. Um, huh, I'm not going to show this, <coughs> but I think it's very rich that they have Mike Novogratz on today um, to ask him if this feels illegal. <laughs> Golly. And then another interesting thing that I saw in this is that Novogratz said in this interview that El Salvador, is, apparently El Salvador may have um, their crypto tied up on this FTX platform. Now that's interesting. and <laughs> can't get it. I want to finish with this. I, those of you that saw my interview with Greg Kidd, who was one of the first people at Ripple, runs hard Yaka. He's an invest, a billionaire investor in Uphold, several things, Uphold, Global ID, Ripple, all these different things. I remember when I interviewed him and he said that when he, he was at a, a card game and he said that, that when, he said that when he heard about Ripple at that card game, it was like Moses coming down. And so my thoughts yesterday when all when the market's crashing and all and by the way i saw all these people saying that the market's crashing oh this is the worst ever no i've been here since 2013 folks i've seen this movie several times the lowest i saw this market go yesterday i think was around and i may be wrong but around 850 billion or something i was here in 2000 was it 18 or 19 when this thing went down to 100 billion and we we weren't 100% sure the industry itself would, would survive at that time. So no, 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 no. This is not the worst thing. They, every, time, every time a crash happens, they like, it's great for the media. They like to say it's the worst. Um, but anyway, my point, back to my point here, is Greg Kidd said it was like Moses coming down. And I got to thinking about it, and I was like, I've always believed XRP is the one. I still do. Wouldn't it be ironic <laughs> if just like uh, God and Moses, par Moses parted the Red Seas, <laughs> the Red Sea, um, to lead his people out and all that, wouldn't it be amazing and ironic if Ripple settled or won this lawsuit right about now <laughs> and led crypto out of all this hell that it's in right this second?
Wouldn't that be amazing? I'm the digital asset investor. I'm not an investment advisor. This is for entertainment purposes only. Please subscribe, hit the like button, and tell your friends and family that for me, XRP is like Moses coming down too. And that's the reason I've been fixated on this one digital asset and this one company for four over four years now, folks. Really more than longer than that. It's because I think this is a one in 200 year thing. And I think that I think my great great grandchildren one day will be be like, how did this? How did how did our great great grandfather see this? Oof, you don't know what I went through, great 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 grandchildren.